So hello and welcome to the ESTRIP Live Journal Club for February 2023. This month's topic is endometrium. My name's Rowan Lowry. I'm at Marta Pathology in Brisbane, Australia on the traditional lands of the Shrubal and Jagera people. I'm joined today by my co-moderators, my colleague Deb Smith, also from Marta Pathology Brisbane, and Karen Talia from Royal Women's Hospital Melbourne on the traditional lands of the Eastern Kulin Nation. We have three presenters today. Um, who will present in three articles relating to topics around endometrial pathology. Now, Journal Club is only one of a number of online educational opportunities offered by ISTRIP and occurs monthly. It's shared between the Eastern and the Western hemispheres, so you can choose the time that's more convenient for you to make it as accessible as possible to everyone. ISTRIP offers lots of other opportunities as well, and we'd really encourage you to join ISTRIP. Membership is free for trainees and is subsidised if you're from a low or middle income country. The schedule for Journal Club, oh sorry, and other things that we do also offer include the interesting case presentations by trainees and pathologists. Um, these are again split between South Africa and the US with Jennifer Bennett in the US and Dr. Rubina Wadadi in South Africa. Importantly, um, you'll be really impressed by our presentations today, but don't feel, don't be intimidated by that. Every trainee who presents is um, supported with our fairly structured program and is given lots of support from moderators to get their presentation together and to present. So don't be intimidated by what you see today. So the learning objectives for Journal Club are to, so Journal Club exists because we want to engage trainees in participating in the scientific literature, both reading it and gaining knowledge, but also critically evaluating the literature as well. And we offer opportunities for trainees and young pathologists from all over the globe to volunteer as both presenters and moderators in both the Eastern and the Western Hemisphere. You're provided with mentorship throughout your time in Journal Club, whether you're presenting or moderating. And we're also keen to engage um, future leaders in our field from around the globe and offer these people mentorship and networking as well. We give trainees a really um, structured approach to being able to present the journal article. This is the kind of format our trainees have been using today to really um, insert themselves into the literature and work out what they need to get out of the process and what they can present to you. So other events coming up in ISTRIP in the month of February, on February the 22nd, there'll be a new podcast released around the updated IWCR guidelines for routine reporting of endometrial carcinoma coming up on the 22nd. Also on the 22nd is the next issue of the interesting cases. Um, this time with three different cases, again on February the 22nd, that's at 7 a.m. US Eastern time. You can register for events at itstrip.ca. You can register for live events. Journal Club also goes up onto YouTube after presentation. And if you're a member of ISTRIP, you can access all the archive presentations as well, which is a really useful and valuable resource. Today's presentation is in a webinar format. So what this means is that you can ask questions as we go along, use the Q&A tab down the bottom of the screen. We'll save all questions for our presenters until the end of the third presentation, where we'll pose the questions at that point. You'll see there's also a chat function. So feel free to pose any questions or any discussion points within the chat function, or even just tell us where you're listening from today. So we have three speakers today around the topic of endometrium. Firstly, will be Betty McDowell talking about morals, but not squamous differentiation as an indicator of beta catenin mutations and endometrial carcinoma and precursors followed by Stephanie Aranza, who will be talking about using P63 and P10 staining in distinguishing cervical microglandular hyperplasia from endometrial endometrial and adenocarcinoma with overlapping histological features. And finally, Debbie Lee from New Zealand will be talking about mesonephric-like endometrial carcinoma and a, screen, a project that looks at screening 300 endometrial carcinomas for this overlooked and potentially aggressive entity. So these are our three speakers. So our first speaker today is Betty McDowell. So Betty is a third year anatomical pathology registrar at Royal North Shore in Sydney, Australia. So Betty, I'll ask you to turn on your camera and share your screen. Thank you. Okay, oops. Okay, is that um, visible now? Thank you, Betty, that's visible, yes. 
Thank you. Uh, so the um, paper I'm presenting today is on, as we said, morals but not squamous differentiation are a reliable indicator of CTNMB1 uh, beta catenin mutations in endometrial carcinoma and precancers. And this paper was by Dr. Nui and colleagues published last year um, in the American Journal of Pathology. So the paper looked at to, um, investigating the association between morals and squamous differentiation with the uh, CTNNB1 mutations. They looked at it in particular with precursor lesions of atypical hyperplasia and endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia and car uh, endometrial endometrioid carcinoma and using beta catenin as a surrogate marker for um, CTNNB1 mutation. So beta catenin, um, we know, is a good uh, IHC is a good surrogate marker for beta uh, sorry for CTNMB1 mutation, and specifically looking at it through with the nuclear staining um, as a, a positive um, marker. It's highly specific and sensitive for the mutation, and in the uh, the tumors that we were discussing today, it tends to be um, seen in the more aggressive uh, tumors and the poor. Uh, prognosis, uh, tumors with poorer prognosis. Um, but we don't often use it in Australia for this specific purpose. So in this paper, we have clear definitions as to what a moral and squamous differentiation is. So you can see the moral here in the picture um, labelled B. Uh, they're more spindled cells with uh, round to ovoid nucle central nuclei, whereas squamous differentiation on the other image um, has more uh, distinct uh, 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 cell borders um, and is more similar to the um, cells that you would see in um, the vulva um, and maybe keratinizing. So as we said, the parameters of this study were looking at morals versus squamous differentiation in AHEIN versus um, carcinomas and using the nuclear beta catenin and immunohistochemistry. There were some other the uh, markers used as well, and I'll discuss that further. And then they used uh, next generation sequencing to confirm the uh, mutation. Uh, there were two gynecologic pathologists involved, and they looked at um, verifying the diagnosis um, and as well as looking at the um, interpretation, uh, interpreting the um, nuclear beta catenin stains. And they analyzed the um, uh, data using a two tailed. Uh, Chi test um, to compare um, the marker expression in the precursor and the carcinoma um, lesions, and a two tailed fish exact test to compare with morals versus squamous differentiation, and then looking at the statistical significance and the fee coefficient to measure agreement. So for the case, there were 270 cases together um, from August 2013 to September 2022, and they were taken from two hospital uh, teaching hospitals, the Clements University and Parkland Memorial Hospital. The age group for the patients were a bit younger to what we tend to see in Australia, 25 to 76 years old with a mean of 36. And you can see here in the morals group, there were a total of 116 cases. Um, uh, which uh, 29 of these cases also had squamous differentiation, but they were in, uh, they had put them in this group. For the next generation sequencing, they took 20 out of the 80 cases that had morals and precursor lesions um, uh, to uh, get that uh, uh, confirmation. So this is a bit of a busy um, table, um, but I'll draw you to the bits that I've highlighted in red. So in the um, precursor lesions for beta catenin um, nuclear staining, uh, there was a 78% uh, uh, positivity um, for lesions with morals and 40% uh, with the squamous differentiation uh, lesions, giving a significant P value. In the carcinoma uh, group, uh, there was 100% in the uh, staining of nuclear beta catenin in the morals versus 17% in the um, squamous differentiation. And again, uh, great p-value and of course, putting it together, we had good p-value. So looking at the association between beta catenin and the um, uh, 
uh, lesions uh, with morals. In the precursor lesion, we've got uh, 0 0.59 uh, value, which um, they had defined as the closer to one uh, was the uh, it was perfect agreement, and anything above far 0 0.5 uh, was uh, seen as a positive, uh, a strong positive association. And then when looking at the uh, carcinoma group, we've got 0 0.85, which is quite close uh, to a uh, near perfect agreement uh, by their um, definition. As I said, there were some other immunohistochemistry uh, results. So they found um, beta catenin, as I've just explained, and CD10 were more associated with lesions with morals. Uh, no difference um, when they looked at P10, and uh, P40 and PAX2 were more associated with the squamous differentiated lesions. For not, uh, the next generation sequencing, all 20 cases that they looked at had the CT and MB1 mutations, which matched up with the um, what we already uh, um, could um, uh, with the positive, sorry. Uh, beta catenin and IHC stains. Interestingly, 17 of these cases also had other mutations. Um, from these 20 cases, there was one single case where they looked at the pre and post treatment um, with uh, progesterone in using um, the IHC and next generation sequencing. And they found that there was identical mutation um, before treatment and uh, after treatment. So I think this, uh, paper sh um, showed that there was a positive association between beta catenin and immunohistochemistry with morals. It showed that there's a distinct immunoprofile between morals and squamous differentiation um, to suggest that morals are not what we, um, I guess, previously had thought that it could be an early form of squamous differentiation. And uh, next generation sequencing um, helped to confirm that uh, beta uh, catenin and IHC is a good surrogate marker. The single case also uh, helped to show that there's possibly a common lineage between morals and the epithelial component of the tumour. And uh, these, uh, this information can um, possibly help us in uh, the cl clinical application of helping prognosticate. The strengths of this uh, paper I felt was that there was overall a large number of cases and there was a clear definition between what was considered a moral and a squamous uh, differentiation. Um, and confirming, uh, it's good to confirm that beta catenin and um, IHC is a good surrogate marker and there was good uh, explanation of the statistical analysis. Uh, although there was a big um, number of cases overall of the um, uh, carcinoma group, uh, the numbers were quite small and they didn't have a breakdown in regards to um, uh, the grading and the staging, nor the age of the patients um, of this group. So um, a little difficult to extrapolate more um, information from there. And seeing as it was e the clear definition between morals and squamous differentiation, uh, the morphology was quite clearly on the slide. And um, uh, so it was a, not a blinded study when looking at the immunohistochemistry. And another area that it can be difficult is that um, beta catenin uh, immunohistochemistry can sometimes be quite difficult to interpret. Um, and just a side point for my own um, that I found difficult was um, the uh, description of the case numbers got a little bit confusing, but um, I, I figured it out in the end. Um, and as uh, I think an important takeaway for pathologists and um, uh, trainees is that uh, there is a difference between squamous morals and squamous differentiation and to step away from the idea that one is an earlier lesion than the other. And as with anything in pathology, adequate sampling and adequate sampling for morals. So even though, um, Beta catenin isn't used in Australia that often for prognostication or for treatment. I think there are still potential applications where we can take away from this paper that knowing that beta catenin and immunohistochemistry is a good surrogate marker for CT and MB1 mutations, and it can help pathologists and clinicians to um, uh, be aware of the greater risk um, of having poor prognosis for patients. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Um, so our next speaker today is Dr. Stephanie Aranza.
So Stephanie is a third year anatomical pathology registrar at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. So Stephanie, um, can I get you to turn on your camera and can we share your screen? Thank you. Yep. Thank you, looks good. Thanks, Ron. All right, um, so uh, today I'm going to present a paper from histopathology from last year um, out of the University of Michigan about the utility of P63 and P10 staining in distinguishing cervical microglandular hyperplasia from endometrial endometroid carcinoma with microglandular and mucinous features. Um, so there is a significant morphological overlap uh, between uh, these two entities, and this poses a challenge, particularly in curatings and small biopsies. Um, a number of previous studies have looked at different immunohistochemical markers um, in an attempt to differentiate between the two, but none have proven to be particularly useful uh, due to poor specificity and sensitivity. So in this present study, um, the authors sought to answer the question, can P63 and P10 be used to reliably differentiate between um, microglandular hyperplasia and endometrioid carcinoma. Um, so uh, microglandular hyperplasia, um, it's a common benign non-neoplastic proliferation of endocervical glands. Um, it typically occurs in reproductive aged women and is thought to be associated with hormonal exposure. Um, Low-grade endometrioid carcinoma typically occurs in postmenopausal women. In terms of histology, um, there's significant overlap, as you can see here. Um, microglandular hyperplasia um, has tightly packed round glands, um, lined by gland cuboidal to columnar endocervical cells, um, intraluminal mucin, acute and chronic inflammation, and there's also atypical forms um, such as this case, uh, uh, which shows reactive atypia. Um, endometrioid carcinoma, with microglandular and mucinous features also shows tightly packed glands um, lined by one or more layers of cuboidal to columnar cells, intraluminal mucin and acute inflammation, relatively bland nuclei with at most mild atypia and um, often has low mitotic activity. Um, this is just a table showing studies um, that have attempted to find a immunohistochemical marker that can be used in this setting. Um, but each of the markers have their own limitations. Um, I won't go through all of them, but just some examples. P16 um, is relatively good. Um, it's positive in endometrioid carcinoma and negative in microglandular hyperplasia, um, but it doesn't show 100% specificity. PAX2 is lost in endometrioid carcinoma, um, but shows poor sensitivity. Uh, Biomentin and BCL2 both show significant overlap between the two entities. Um, CEA and P53 are negative in both, and E and P are usually positive in both, so um, they're not particularly helpful. Um, just a quick look at endocervical subcolumnar reserve cells, which are going to be important in this study. Um, so they're present beneath the endocervical epithelium, just proximal to the squamous columnar junction. Um, they're present in microglandular hyperplasia, but are usually difficult to see on HNE, um, but they can be prominent as in this image. Um, they stain for P63 and they're important in the formation of the transformation zone um, by undergoing squamous differentiation. Um, and just a, a bit about P10, it's a tumor suppressor gene. Um, inactivating P10 mutations are found in the majority of low-grade endometrioid carcinomas and there's retained function in normal endocervical and endometrial glandular epithelium. Um, so in this study, 63 cases were retrieved from the University of Michigan um, archives with roughly half having a diagnosis of microglandular hyperplasia and the other half um, endometrioid carcinoma with microglandular and mucinous, mucinous features. Um, there was also a subset of cases uh, showing atypical microglandular proliferation, and three of these cases um, also had subsequent diagnostic specimens. Um, so each case was assessed for a range of morphological features and P63 and P10 staining. Um, so the demographics of the study population were um, age 25 to 93, um, with the mean age for microglandular hyperplasia being 20 years younger than the mean age for endometrioid carcinoma. 
um, and there was a range of postmenopausal, perimenopausal and reproductive aged women. Um, so the morphology of the cases were compared and there were statistically significant differences in um, glandular architecture. Um, so uh, the majority of microglandular hyperplasias um, showed small tightly packed glands, whereas the endometrioid carcinomas showed medium to large tightly packed glands. 38% um, of microglandular hyperplasias um, showed subnuclear vacuoles, whereas only one case of the endometrioid carcinoma did. Um, a quarter of the endometrioid carcinomas showed um, framing histiocytes compared to only one case of microglandular hyperplasia. And the majority of um, endometrioid carcinomas showed mild to moderate atypia, whereas none of the microglandular hyperplasia cases did. Um, there was also significant differences in P63 staining. So all of the microglandular hyperplasia cases showed um, a characteristic linear P63 um, staining of the subcolumnar reserve cells, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, and this pattern was not seen in any of the endometrioid carcinomas. Um, there were also significant differences in P10 staining. Um, so P10 expression was intact in all but one case of microglandular hyperplasia. Um, and the majority of endometrioid carcinomas showed loss of P10 expression. And there were no significant differences in luminal secretions and mucin, uh, inflammation, luminal squamous metaplasia or mitotic figures. Um, so just showing some of those results, uh, microglandular hyperplasia um, was associated with small tightly packed glands, uh, subnuclear vacuoles, which you can see at the arrow. Um, bottom left shows that characteristic linear P63 nucleus staining of the subcolumnar reserve cells, um, and there was intact P10 um, expression. With the endometrioid um, carcinomas, uh, they are associated with medium to large tightly packed glands, um, framing histiocytes and cytological atypia. There was loss of P10 expression and um, there uh, was a lack of that subcolumnar linear P63 staining that we saw in the microglandular hyperplasia. Um, just to note, several cases um, of endometrioid carcinoma did show focal non-specific P63 staining um, or staining of squamous differentiation. Um, which will become important later. Um, so the atypical microglandular proliferation cases were analyzed separately. Um, so three of the cases had follow-up specimens. So the diagnosis based on the initial biopsy could be compared to the diagnosis on the follow-up specimen. Um, two of the cases had endometrioid carcinoma and follow-up. So you can see one of the cases in the top row um, histology showed microglandular features, but with mild cytological atypia. Um, P63 was negative and um, uh, there was loss of P10 expression. Um, so endometrioid carcinoma was correctly predicted in the follow-up um, follow specimen based on the previous results. Um, one case had microglandular hyperplasia on the follow-up specimen. Um, so you can see that in the second row. Histology showed small tightly packed glands with squamous and mucinous differentiation. Um, the P63 stained the subcolumnar cells, but also squamous metaplasia. So you didn't see that characteristic linear staining in this case. Um, and P10 expression was intact. So microglandular hyperplasia was correctly predicted in the follow-up specimen. Um, so despite significant overlap, um, uh, there is specific morphological features that can help to differentiate between um, these two entities. So microglandular hyperplasia um, shows small tightly packed glands and um, subnuclear vacuoles, whereas endometrioid carcinoma shows medium to large complex glands, atypia and foamy histiocytes. Um, there was a previous study um, from the International Journal of Gynae Path in 2003 um, that also um, compared the morphological features and uh, of, of these two entities. And they found similar results, um, but they did find significant differences in luminal squamous metaplasia and mitoses and no significant difference in atypia. Um, but this was a, a slightly smaller study. Um, so 
uh, previous studies have not um, identified reliable immunohistochemical markers um, uh, that can be used in this setting. A previous study did look at P63 and found a high proportion of positive staining cells in microglandular hyperplasia compared to endometrioid carcinoma, but um, they did not look at the pattern of staining. Um, and this current study showed that P63 and P10 um, can be used to reliably differentiate between the two entities and are particularly useful in um, cases with atypical morphology. Um, so presence of linear P63 um, subcolumnar reserve cell staining is sensitive and specific for microglandular hyperplasia and loss of P10 staining is sensitive and specific for endometrioid carcinoma. Um, this paper um, is worth mentioning from 2005 in human pathology, um, highlights a potential weakness in, in this current study. Um, so microglandular hyperplasia is actually a sequential process um, and there are different patterns of P63 staining at each stage. Um, so you can see uh, in early microglandular hyperplasia, there's uh, microacinar architecture and abundant subnuclear vacuoles. Um, and then in late microglandular hyperplasia, you can see increased stroma and more prominent um, uh, subcolumnar reserve cells. And the process terminates in mature squamous meroplasia, which you can see on the right. Um, and then uh, corresponding to these stages, um, there's different patterns of P63 staining. So in the early phase, you can see weak focal staining of columnar and subcolumnar reserve cells. And in the later stages, you can see characteristic linear subcolumnar staining of um, reserve, cells, reserve cells like we saw in, in this study. Um, so um, this paper shows uh, that linear subcolumnar P63 reserve cell staining is only seen in late as opposed to early microglandular hyperplasia. Um, and this indicates that P63 cannot be used to reliably differentiate between early um, microglandular hyperplasia and endometrioid carcinoma, which can both show focal P63 staining as we saw in this um, current study. Um, another point to quickly mention is that according to this recent paper from last year um, in the Interna International Journal of Gynepath, um, the sensitivity and specificity of P10 immunohistochemistry um, is not high enough for it to be considered a surrogate for P10 mutational status. Um, some cases of endometrioid carcinoma with P10 mutation um, will still show preserved P10 staining and that can be explained by the nature of the mutation. So um, some mutations uh, produce a non-functional protein that can still be picked up by immunohistochemistry um, uh, as well as assay failure. Um, so these cases of endometrioid carcinoma um, can't be reliably differentiated from early microglandular hyperplasia, um, which also shows intact P10 expression um, and does not show that characteristic linear um, P63 staining. Um, so the strengths of this study include that um, they had a relatively large cohort of endometrioid carcinoma with microglandular and mucinous features, and the fact that the pattern of P63 staining um, and not just the presence or proportion of positive cells was looked at, um, and that proved to have a high sensitivity and specificity. Um, areas for improvement, um, there were only three cases of atypical microglandular proliferation with follow-up specimens um, to confirm the predicted diagnosis. Um, the age of the microglandular hyperplasia cases was not um, considered and the uh, results of this study only applied to the late stage. The, um, a subset of endometrioid carcinomas uh, do not have P10 mutations and therefore would not show loss of P10 staining, um, that wasn't considered. And the accuracy of the P10 immunohistochemistry as a surrogate for mutational status um, was not really accounted for and may pose problems in differentiating um, from early microglandular hyperplasia. Um, the applications of this study include um, the use in the diagnosis of atypical, um, in the diagnosis of atypical microglandular proliferations, um, as well as providing a foundation for further research, um, including larger studies um, and investigation of other markers that could be used in this setting. Um, so in conclusion, um, morphological assessment used in conjunction with immunohistochemistry 
as well as clinical and radio, uh, radio, radiological correlation um, is required in the differential diagnosis of microglandular hyperplasia and endometrioid carcinoma. Um, combination of P63 and P10 uh, immunohistochemistry has a high specificity and sensitivity. Um, and further studies with larger numbers of atypical microglandular proliferations um, uh, with follow-up specimens are required to confirm the utility of these results. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So um, our third speaker today is Debbie Lee. So Debbie is a second year pathology registrar. She's at PathLab, Taronga in New Zealand. Um, thank you, Debbie, if you can share your screen, thank you. Yeah. All good. Thank you. I'm so be discussing this paper titled Mesonephric-like endometrial carcinoma, results from immunohistochemical screening of 300 endometrial carcinomas and carcinosarcomas for this often overlooked and potentially aggressive entity. This was published in July 2022 in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology. Mesonephric-like endometrial carcinoma is a recently recognized entity. It is rare, making up 1% or slightly under 1% of all endometrial carcinomas. It is known to be aggressive with frequent recurrences and also known to metastasize often to the lung. A common morphologic pattern is tubules with intraluminal eosinophilic secretions. However, it can show a range of architectures, including glandular, papillary, ductal, retiform, solid, or spindled architecture. The tumor cells often have oval nuclei with vesicular chromatin. This tumor shows positive staining for TTF1, GATA3, and luminal CD10 and is typically negative for ER or only focally positive. A high proportion of these tumors show KRAS mutations. The aims of the study was to look at the frequency of overlooked mesonephric-like carcinomas in the patient population, and also to assess an immunohistochemistry-based screening approach, looking at the specificity of positive TTF1, GATA3, CD10 expression with or without ER expression for diagnosis. This was a retrospective study looking at all endometrial carcinomas and carcinosarcomas diagnosed over a three-year period. Punch cores were taken from tumor blocks for tissue microarray construction, and IHC staining was performed on the TMAs. In addition to TTF1, GATA3, CD10, and ER, stains were also performed for P53 and PAX8. The MMR status was obtained from testing completed at the time of original diagnosis. All cases that screened positive for possible mesonephric-like differentiation then underwent morphologic and molecular assessments. In the study, a total of 300 cases were included and nine out of 300 cases expressed at least one IHC marker of mesonephric-like differentiation. All nine cases were positive for TTF1. Two cases also co-expressed GATA3, and no cases had luminal CD10 expression. Two out of these nine cases were reclassified as mesonephric-like carcinoma after morphologic and molecular review. The other seven cases did not meet criteria for diagnosis of this entity after morphologic and molecular review. This table summarizes the features of the 300 cases that were included in the study. So the majority, 80% of the cases were originally diagnosed as endometrioid carcinoma. The remaining were D-differentiated carcinoma, serous carcinoma, or carcinosarcoma. This table shows the features of the nine cases that screened positive on IHC for mesonephric-like differentiation marker. Case one was originally diagnosed as a grade one endometrioid carcinoma. After morphologic and molecular review, it was reclassified to mesonephric-like carcinoma. And I will discuss this case further in the next few slides. Cases two, four, and five were all originally diagnosed as serous carcinoma and all three cases retained this diagnosis. This is because on morphologic review, they showed typical serous features. 
On IHC, they had diffuse overexpression of P53, and molecular testing revealed TP50 mutation, TP53 mutation in all three cases. Case 3 was originally diagnosed as a grade 3 endometrioid carcinoma and retained this diagnosis. It had endometrioid morphology with clear squamous differentiation. Case 6 was originally diagnosed as a grade 2 endometrioid carcinoma and retained this diagnosis as it had endometrioid morphology. It also was MMR deficient and had a complex mutational profile that was compatible with a hypermutated endometrioid tumor. Case 7 was originally diagnosed as a grade 1 endometrioid carcinoma and morphology supported retaining this diagnosis and prominent mucinous features were noted. Case 8 was originally diagnosed as a grade 2 endometrioid carcinoma and was reclassified to mesonephric like carcinoma after re review and I'll also be discussing this case further in the next few slides. Case 9 was originally diagnosed as a grade 3 endometrioid carcinoma. On morphologic review, it had areas of well-differentiated endometrioid glands and also had a component composed of poorly differentiated solid um, tumor cells. It was reclassified to a de-differentiated carcinoma. It was MMR deficient and also had a complex mutational profile that was consistent with its final diagnosis of de-differentiated carcinoma. This slide shows the histology images from case one. So this tumor had papillary, tubular, solid, and glandular growth patterns. It focally had small tubules with tumor cells with oval nuclei and intraluminal eosinophilic secretions. This slide shows the histology from case eight. It, this tumor was composed of glands and tubules and focally had intraluminal eosinophilic secretions. And this can be seen in the top two images in images A and B. In the lower images, images C and D, um, you can see that the tumor cells have oval nuclei with vesicular chromatin. The slide shows the results of IHC staining on cases one and eight. So both cases diffusely expressed TTF1 and were both ER negative. Case one had focal positivity for GATA3. Um, case eight was negative for GATA3. Both cases were also CD10 negative, had wild type expression for P53 and were positive for PAX8. In addition, both cases had intact MMR proteins and molecular testing revealed KRAS mutations in both cases. So when the um, morphology review was combined with the immunohistochemistry results and the molecular testing results, these two cases were reclassified to mesonephric like carcinoma. Moving on to some discussion points. And the study showed that TTF1 can be useful in diagnosing mesonephric-like endometrial carcinomas. And in this study, it was more sensitive than GATA3. And this is different to previous studies that have found GATA3 to have higher sensitivity. One of these prior studies by Yusho and colleagues, um, however, noted that GATA3 expression was often more focal than TTF1. Another study by Paws and colleagues looked at both cervical mesonephric carcinomas and mesonephric-like endometrial carcinomas and found that although TTF1 was less sensitive in cervical mesonephric carcinomas, it showed 100% sensitivity for mesonephric-like endometrial carcinomas. In this study, no cases had luminal CD10 staining. Therefore, suggests, therefore this suggests that CD10 perhaps has a limited value in screening and diagnosis for this entity. ER is a useful companion stain, and staining is expected to be absent or minimal. And in this study, both cases of mesonephric like carcinoma were negative for ER staining. I think one of the most important points that was highlighted in the study is that a TTF1 ER negative immunophenotype is not specific for mesonephric like carcinoma. And likewise, KRAS mutations are also not specific for this entity. 
a TTF1 positive ER negative immunoprofile was also found in serous and endometrial carcinomas and the, and the D differentiated component of a D differentiated carcinoma in the study. KOS mutations were also found in serous and endometrial carcinomas and a D differentiated carcinoma in the study. Therefore, it's important um, when making the diagnosis of mesonephric like endometrial carcinoma to combine the morphologic features with IHC and also molecular testing if relevant. One of the strengths of this study was that it screened a large number of endometrial carcinomas and performed IHC on all cases. It also showed the value of TTF1 and ER as first line screens. Although it screened a large number of endometrial carcinomas, it only identified two cases of mesonephric-like carcinoma, which is a very small number. So I think it would be beneficial in the future to have a follow-up study with increased number of cases. I also think it would be beneficial to have a study which assesses the sensitivity of IHC, of IHC screening. The study did not address this as morphologic and molecular reviews were only done on the nine cases that screened positive on IHC. So it's possible that some cases of mesonephric like carcinoma were missed in the series. And another possible limitation that I want to raise was the study's use of TMA. GATA3 and CD10 have both previously been reported to have focal staining in mesonephric like endometrial carcinoma. And therefore, the use of TMA may have contributed to the lower rates of GATA3 expression and the lack of CD10 expression in the study. These markers could potentially have higher rates of expression and potentially have more value in diagnosing this entity when whole sections are stained. In terms of how this applies to practice, uh, firstly, I think it's important to be aware of this entity and include, it in differential, uh, and include it in differentials for endometrial cancers with a variety of morphologies. It's also important to have this differential in lung tumors in a patient with a history of endometrial carcinoma. In this situation, consideration should be given to reviewing the histology of previous endometrial carcinomas, performing a PAX-8 stain on the lung tumor and a TTF1 stain on the endometrial specimen. The study showed that the IHC and molecular profile were not specific and overlapped with other endometrial cancers. Therefore, it's important to not rely on the IHC or molecular profile for diagnosis as this has the risk of leading to overdiagnosis of this entity. And as mentioned previously, GATA3 um, is reported to have focal staining in mesonephric like endometrial carcinoma. And therefore, if only GATA3 was used for screening, then cases could be missed. Therefore, it's advisable to use both GATA3 and TTF1, especially when dealing with small biopsy samples. And thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Debbie. So um, at the conclusion of our final presentation, I'll ask our three presenters and our moderators, that's Dr. Deb Smith, Dr. Karen Talia, and Dr. Natalie Benet, who's also here, um, to fire up their cameras. We do have a question in the Q&A. So our first question from the floor is for Betty regarding peter catena mutations, squamous morals, and squamous differentiation. So uh, thank you, thank you for the nice presentations. From the first presentation, I want to ask if the EEC had the same grade, was the staining profile different if the cancer had both morals and squamous differentiation in the same case? So I suppose Betty, did the paper answer those questions for you? Um, the paper didn't specifically go into the grading um, or there was no information about um, the carcinomas other than that they were carcinomas. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have that information. Um, for the tumours that did have um, uh, morals and squamous differentiation, they uh, simply put it as um, positive beta catenin um, and they didn't uh, really uh, dive into a bit more specifics around um, uh, the specific uh, around the staining for beta catenin. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. And so I also have a question for Debbie regarding the mesonephric-like adenocarcinomas. I suppose the question would be, what's your takeaway from that paper? And particularly in how's it going to affect your approach to diagnosing endometrial cancers now? Will it change, do you think, after reading that paper? Or how much more supplemental IHC might you be doing? Or do you think your approach should stay the same? Um, so for me, I wasn't aware of this entity until I looked at this paper. Um, so now I would definitely be including it in the differentials if I do look at any endometrial specimens in the future. Um, I think particularly if I was looking at an endometrial specimen and it was negative for ER and it also had appropriate morphology, then I'd begin thinking about um, this entity more and then in that situation, I then might consider doing other IHC stains like TTF1 or GATF3. Thank you. So um, I'll open the floor to any other questions. I just wanted to pick up on that point about an endometrial an endometrioid carcinoma being negative for ER. I think that's got to be a big red flag that goes up and prompts you to stop and have a good think about your diagnosis. We've seen a few cases. One was a metastasis from the gallbladder, of all things, um, that um, had somehow permeated the myometrium, gotten into the endometrial cavity that was masquerading as an endometrial primary. Um, I guess that there's overlap there with the gastric type endometrial carcinomas that have been recently described. And of course, clear cell carcinoma, and now these mesonephric type um, carcinomas or mesonephric-like carcinomas, all of which have a poor prognosis. So I think we've really got to be alert to uh, negative ERPR staining when we're reporting an endometrial curatage specimen and, and make that a trigger to think about other things. Well, what would be your key triggers morphologically, Karen? Um, I think the cases I've seen of mesonephric do you mean for mesonephric-like carcinoma? Yeah, well, when, when you think about, say, doing a TTF1 upfront rather than say, yeah. waiting for your ER to come back negative. I've actually fallen into the trap of assuming that a mesonephric carcinoma was endometrioid on morphology and gone down that pathway um, on a small biopsy, a curatage specimen. Um, it was actually a cervical tumour that was presenting um, at the cervix and it was in a postmenopausal woman and it was a, a kind of a grab at the protruding tumour mass that, and we made the assumption that it was of endometrial origin extending down. So I don't know if I'm very good on morphology. <laughs> um, that was a, a very pseudo-endometrioid-like um, appearance though. It, it had a predominance of large um, gland-like formations. I think the clue in that case was um, the fact that there was diverse architecture. There were also tubules with luminal secretions. If you looked really hard, there were trabecular arrangements and there were foci that was solid. And throughout there was this uniform nuclear morphology. Um, it wasn't quite the papillary carcinoma like, but it, it was bland. Um, and what got us onto the right path with that case was the ER. As soon as that came back, um, we, we knew straight away that it, it wasn't an endometrioid. So then the differential opens up. But yeah, they, they are great imitators, mesonephric like and mesonephric carcinomas. But I think it's the diversity of architectural patterns and the somewhat monotonous nuclear morphology. And I, I think the other interesting point from that paper was that Debbie picked up on was about the heterogeneity of GATA3 staining and the point that they'd use TMAs. What's your experience with GATA3 in that kind of setting? I mean, I know everyone's only seen small numbers of these, but yeah. it seems problematic if your staining is going to be heterogeneous. My experience is multifocal and patchy staining is the norm, not that I've had many. Um, for both TTF1 and GATA3. In fact, the cases I've seen haven't really done much with TTF1. GATA3 has been more useful. Mm -hmm. So are there any, any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, Deb can actually speak far better to, to that than me because she's, I think, diagnosed our best um, mesonephric-like adenocarcinoma. So I'll throw to Deb for that. Um, so the one we've had that, is my screen coming up? 
Yeah. And the one we've had that was a uh, mesonephric was strongly TTF1 positive. But again, we picked it up based on the negative ER. So we've been shouting out. I think the thing is a lot of our low-grade endometrioids, which is what you're worried about. I mean, the high-grade tumors mucking up with a mesonephric is not such a big deal. But you are concerned about your low-grade endometrioids getting mixed up with your mesonephric. So we've been trying to push the recommendations from the British Association of Gynae Pathologists, written by Navina Sang, um, to do MMR, P53, and ER on your biopsies. Because that means that then you don't have to recognize the morphology. You've, you're sort of triggered that something's wrong up front. Because I think, as I say, most of our low-grade endometrioids are being done by um, non-gynae pathologists. So um, I, th I think that the, the safety is in recognizing them as not being low-grade. Yeah, I agree. And just being aware. Mm. And it's not just in the um, endometrium, it's also out in the ovary as well now um, that these have been described. So it's just building awareness that they exist. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I suppose on this point, with the, the concept that mesonephric like adenocarcinomas are malarian, truly malarian cancers just with mesonephric differentiation, do you think we're going to see mixed forms or not quite well differentiated forms. Uh, so we're going to see incomplete mesonephric differentiation in some of these, because it seems to be a lot of the time these cases are presented as being very clear cut mesonephric like, even though they have their malarian background. But do you think we'll start? Do you think we'll start turning up mixed tumors or morphologies that overlap with more classic malarian carcinomas? Well, I think that's that's been established in the adnexal primaries that they mm. uh, have arisen as mixed tumours. Um, I'm not sure how many of the described cases in the uterus have been pure and how many have been mixed. Um, I presume there would be, if that is the um, the ultimate uh, proven progression pathway and how these tumours evolve is from a malarian primary, then I would imagine a mixed tumour would be a logical um, possibility. Yeah. Anyone got any experience in that? No, but every time I read a paper about mesonephric like carcinoma, I wonder what were these being called yes. before? And because mm -hmm. like you say, the morphology can be so subtle that I think once you find one, like Deb, you were saying you found one because of your ER, which is brilliant it sort of makes you see them everywhere a little bit. Like you, you sort of start ruling them out more and more. So I think we're probably gonna see a lot more now, Rowan, because we're all looking for them, right? And before we weren't looking. So I think that'll be an interesting thing to follow up on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So Can I, I asked a question, question of, oh, sorry, okay. Please Deborah, go. I was just going to ask um, Stephanie about the P10, P63. Do you have P10 in your lab? Do you use it? Um, yeah, we we don't have P10 um, at my lab. And I don't think it's widely used in Australia. Um, but one of the papers I was reading, um, they talked about the interpretation of the stain being difficult and um, like there's not clear criteria and there's like different staining patterns. So I thought maybe that's why, but um, yeah. Deb, I had that question lined up as well for Stephanie because it's not a stain I've seen used in practice in um, my experience, although I know the Austin have it and they do use it. And given the WHO Blue Book state that loss of P10 and PAX2 are desirable features for a diagnosis of atypical hyperplasia. Maybe it's something we need to start to look at. Um, and there's that paper that came out last year in AJSP about the combination of P10, PAX2 and beta-catenin staining being a useful um, panel to discriminate atypical hyperplasia. So perhaps it's a stain we need to start to explore. We have well, it, and I have to admit, oh, I, it's hard. I don't know. I was going to say, I find it helpful when it's lost. And um, Stephanie, I know when you were presenting, you were talking about how it's not necessarily sensitive or specific for endometrioid adenocarcinoma. And my general experience is that I usually do my first round of stains. And then if I'm like, oh, I'm still wondering, then I'll do P10. And then it's really only helpful when it's lost. And it can be very hard to interpret 
Um, I feel the same way about that that I feel about beta catenin. Like I always take a nice deep breath before I even look at the slide, right? Because I know what I'm getting into, right? And I do it to myself. So anyway, I'm sorry for interrupting you, Deb. Now, we certainly have P10 in health, which actually is because the prostate pathologist actually got it in at first. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, it, when it works, it's really nice. When you've got really good loss, that works really nicely. And sometimes when it's really retained, that's really nice and it works really well. I do find we have a subset of specimens where you get this very weak staining, which isn't total loss. And I never know if that's just bad staining on a bad day. Is it real? Is it not? And of course, it always does it on the specimens where the answer would be most important. But yeah, on a good day though, the loss, looking for loss works really well, I find. And so what's the application that you use it is it to prove endometrioid lineage or is it in that atypical hyperplasia context? Um, I've used it mainly for, for the first um, the first part of that to think about yep. is this endometrioid or could it potentially be serous? And it's, it's useful yep. in that. I mean, it's obviously not something you look at alone, but it, I found it quite useful in that. And particularly in a small biopsy with ambiguous morphology, it just just helps strengthen your hand a little bit. I just, mm -hmm. uh, I read that the PAX2 P10 paper the other day, and that's something we'd be very interested in trying to yeah. play with up here, particularly um, for us with the large number of progestin modified um, mm -hmm. endometriums that we see on repeat sampling, where you'd wonder if it might help clarify some of the atypia that you see in that setting, where is it real atypia or is it just reactive? That something like that would be really useful. And that might be something we'll explore. Yeah, likewise. I think we're going to get both of those stains in um, because we don't have PAX2 either. So P10 and PAX2 and then give that a go because it's a daily dilemma. We're all huddled around the multi-header trying to decide whether or not there's atypia. Yep. So... so um, I suppose that leads into one last question, which would be for Betty. As Natalie has inferred, beta-catenin staining and staining interpretation isn't a walk in the park. I suppose from reading your paper, what did you take away about interpreting beta-catenin staining and what did you think about the way they interpreted it? I think um, uh, the beta-catenin staining is quite difficult on a normal day. It's uh, with specifically looking for nuclear staining. And I know that um, uh, reading the article as well as um, um, uh, my training as well, the normal endometrium can have um, membrane staining in the normal um, tissue. So it makes it quite difficult, I guess, if you're not aware of what to look at. But having said that though, the authors, even though they didn't specifically say in this paper, they referred to one of their other papers um, that talked about interpretation of um, beta catenin. Um, it seemed like very, the threshold for calling it positive is quite low, needing um, only a little bit of nuclear um, staining um, to call it positive. I mean, I always find them very tricky. It certainly isn't a stain that you can just whiz over quite quickly and call positive negative. It is tricky to interpret in that regard. I'm not sure what anyone else's experiences would be, but it, it can. I think it's a stain that's worth looking at for a while and sometimes training yourself to look at it in a way. Well, I think we've just about made it to the top of the hour, so. I'd like to thank our three presenters today, Betty, Stephanie and Debbie for their presentations and some really interesting discussions I think that have made us think about the cases that you see every day and how we, how we interpret them and how you interpret some of our IHC. Thank you to my co-moderators today, that's Deb Smith, Karen Talia and thank you to Dr Natalie Benet. There'll be no March Journal Club coming up because of the United States and Canadian Academy of Pathology meeting in March. The next Journal Club will instead be coming from the Western Hemisphere in April, modified by Dr. Natalie Benet, and will cover therapeutic and diagnostic markers in the Ghani tract. So thank you everyone who's joined us today and goodbye. Thank you.